Please turn now to Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. Hear now the word of God. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered into the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as someone having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. And they all were amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. So we say together, thanks be to God. I invite you now as we prepare to lean in to God's presence in the message to join me in a moment of silence. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight this morning, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Not too long ago, in a different time, in a different place, I sat in a cozy, locally owned establishment sharing a wonderful conversation over a cup of coffee with a friend. And I found myself leaning in to hear more as I heard my friend say, I wouldn't really say that Jesus is my Lord. That is not, expe that is not what I expected my friend to say. This was a devout follower of Jesus. And I had so many questions, but I took a deep breath. And I didn't say anything because I was intent on learning more with an open heart and an open mind. And so my friend continued, you know, Jesus is definitely my savior. I would even consider Jesus to be my friend, he said. But Jesus isn't really my Lord. I don't give him that much authority in my life. I really appreciate it when discussions of faith get real, don't you? I mean, it's so easy to feel intimidated when you think about people who seem to have it all together in the faith department. And you know the kind of people that I'm talking about. These are the people who, who get up early every morning to read the Bible, and they pray, and they never seem to have any doubt. Their faith doesn't waver in any circumstance because their trust in God is so deep and so profound. And if that's you, hallelujah. I can learn from you in that. If that's not you, solidarity. You are not alone. I would even include myself in that statement because we all struggle in our faith sometimes, even if we don't want to admit that that's what's happening. There are times when we struggle with our faith. We all wrestle with our own demons so to speak. And that's often how we talk about demons in this day and age as attitudes or habits of behavior, possibly our addictions, maybe some illness. We talk about demons and the ways that we struggle. But that was not always the case for followers of Jesus. In the time of Jesus, in the Mediterranean world, 
it was not unusual for people to talk about being possessed by demons. And part of the reason is because of the way that the hierarchy worked. It was thought that supernatural beings, even evil ones, had power over human beings, that they were more powerful than human beings were. So it's not unusual to read a story in Matthew, Mark, or in Luke especially about Jesus casting out demons or about the disciples even casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And we learned last week as we read our story a little bit earlier in Mark that Jesus actually gave the disciples authority over the unclean spirits or the impure spirits. They were sent to cast out demons. And this is all part of our understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. This is our third week of our Come to Jesus meetings series. And we started two weeks ago with a reminder that there's always an invitation for us to come and see to live in our faith with some curiosity, just as Philip invited Nathaniel to do. And then last week, we talked about what it means to fish for people, to share our faith in real and practical and tangible ways as we follow Jesus. And now this week, we follow Jesus into a very sticky situation. We follow Jesus into the synagogue. We're picking up our story right after Jesus has called James and John and Andrew and Peter, and they are traveling with him, our text tells us, to Capernaum. And that is where Jesus walks right into the synagogue, the house of worship, and wows everyone with his teaching. He's teaching in a different way. The people say, who is this? What's going on here? He's not teaching as the scribes teach. Now, this could seem like an insult to the scribes, but it's really just an observation. The scribes, the rabbis, they were experts in the law, and the people would come to them in the houses of worship to ask them about the word of God. And often their answers would be in the form of quotations. They would be repeating or reciting the scripture, the, the word of God as they knew it. At the time, Jesus was different. The people say he's speaking with some personal authority, with some insight into not only the word of God, but the will of God. What is this? What is this? Who is this? Jesus is described as teaching as one who has authority. And that sentiment, that observation is put to the test when someone who is described as having an unclean spirit approaches Jesus and challenges him. This is another way to talk about someone who was considered to be possessed by a demon. So Jesus casts out that demon right there in the synagogue with everybody watching, and people are amazed. But it isn't just the healing of the man with the unclean spirit that proves to be amazing, although that could be enough. Now, the truly remarkable detail is found in the confession of the demon. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. What is this? The crowds ask. And understandably so, because as a carpenter's son, Jesus would not have been expected to speak in that way publicly, certainly not in any sort of way that would have grabbed the people's attention. And so his message and then the demon's reaction to it, it challenges the status quo because it raises questions about Jesus' social standing. He was a craftsman's son. And now he's teaching as someone who has authority, and even the demons recognize him as a divine being. And so the chatter about his teaching and the casting out of the demons, it just, it expands. It's carried throughout the region. A reputation is being formed about Jesus as he continues in his ministry. And beloved, what we're seeing here in these verses is not just the story of the healing of some sin-sick person, although that's part of it. 
nor is it merely a question of the identity of Jesus in the eyes of the people in the synagogue or even in the crowds that will form throughout Galilee. It's not even just a tale of supernatural beings and the role of Jesus in interacting with them. This is an authority issue. It's an authority issue. And it comes back to that moment in the coffee shop with my friend when he said, Jesus is my savior. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is not my Lord because I don't give him that much authority over my life. Well, the problems that we Americans have with authority are well documented in all areas of life. That isn't really anything new. For the sake of a common definition, let's say here that authority is the ability to influence another person's behavior. We may not agree about much in our nation these days, but I think most of us would say that we prefer to have authority over ourselves and over our own lives. We prefer to have authority over ourselves and over our own lives. Autonomy, choice, control, freedom, personal agency. We can call it many things, but it boils down to authority. We want it for ourselves. We work hard for it, and we don't want to give it up, even to Jesus. Beloved, that is a problem. And that's exactly what my friend was saying. His confession about his struggle with the authority of Jesus in his life was just that. It was a confession. He wasn't bragging. He wasn't proud of the idol that he had made of his own individualism. He was presenting this idea to me as a weakness, as an opportunity to grow in his faith. He was coming to the realization that his own power paled in comparison to the power of Jesus. I mean, Jesus commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. What is this? That's the question of the people in the synagogue as they witness this moment of healing in this first chapter in the Gospel of Mark. What is this? Who is this teacher? Who is this person who is teaching with such authority? Beloved, I wonder, have we stopped asking that question for ourselves? Have we become so comfortable, have we become so comfortable with Jesus as our Savior and as our friend that we've stopped recognizing his authority in our lives? Do we give Jesus the power to cast out our own demons? Demons come in all shapes and sizes after all. Again, in the Mediterranean world of Jesus' day, the idea was that demons could possess people fairly easily because they were stronger than human beings. So that's not how we talk about demons in this world today. We use demons much more casually to describe all sorts of patterns of behavior, addictions, illnesses, even differences among us that we don't understand. And sometimes those misunderstandings, that fear can lead us to demonize each other. We can easily demonize each other at times based on any number of things, gender, skin color, ethnicity, language, age, generation, sexuality, politics, economics, theology. If you think I'm exaggerating here, then I would wager to guess that you're not paying attention to current events in our country or in the church at large even. I mean, heaven help us, literally. And that's the good news, beloved. That's the good news. Heaven can help us right where we are, right where we live, if we're willing to enter into the work that God is already doing in our midst. But first, we have to be willing to face our own demons. We have to be willing to face our own demons. And prayer is one way that we can do that if we are willing to pray for ourselves. And yes, I just said pray for ourselves. And I know that that makes us uncomfortable, some of us. It's much, it's much easier for us to pray for each other, for 
other people. It feels funny sometimes to pray for ourselves, but let me assure you that praying for yourself is one of the best things that you can do for the people in your life. It is in the vulnerable moments with God that we can acknowledge those destructive patterns of behavior, those blinders of ignorance, those pockets of prejudice that keep us from really living into the fullness of life that Jesus offers us. It is an honest and open communication with God that we can name any authority gap that we have in our lives and repent of trying to control ourselves and others by sheer force of will. It's in facing our own demons in the name of Jesus that those very demons begin to lose power over us. And so that's my invitation to all of us this week to pray, to sit in silence and to pray, to pray for ourselves, to pray for God's insight into our life to ask the question, what is this? Not just of Jesus, but of ourselves as well. And it is my hope and my prayer that in considering that question, we would find the courage, beloved, to name our burdens that need to be lifted and then give Jesus the authority to do the heavy lifting. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we confess that we have not always lived as those who are forgiven, set free, united in Christ. O oh God, source of life and grace, we are aware that we are at times prisoners of our own fears and habits. Through the healing touch of Christ, set us free once more to live and to love that we may be the people you have created us to be. And may we cling to the good news that Christ calls us to such a new life and enables us to begin again and again and again. Praise be to God. Amen.